everyone. My name is Sal Sao and <coughs> I'm co-founder of Tetra Science. Tetra Science is an Internet of Things platform for research and development. Our mission is to bring the IoT into the lab. We do this by connecting scientific instruments to a single online dashboard so that teams can monitor their experiment, access data, and do analytics. <coughs> Today, I'd like to discuss with you a few case studies that were conducted with a customer of us, an enterprise customer. They were trying to solve some challenges that exist in all pharma labs, as well as labs in general. Uh, <clears throat> when we think about labs and science, there are three main issues that exist nowadays. Inability to react quickly when experimental, uh, um, when experiment uh, go uh, out of range. Also, data fragmentation, data is still uh, siloed. It's hard to access, hard to manage, and hard to analyze. Additionally, inefficient resource allocation, which in pharma uh, creates a lot of problems in terms of like managing budgets, people, and instruments. <clears throat> we believe that this all stems from the context of fragmented ecosystem, with, where people, instrument, and data are all disconnected. By building a IoT-based platform purposely made for science, we can connect all these dots together. In fact, slow reaction time can be solved by adding an always-on monitoring system, data fragmentation with the integrated reporting and informatics, additionally inefficient resource allocation with utilization analytics. Now let's dig into some study cases. The first challenge that this customer of us was trying to solve was resource allocation. They are very interested in mass spectrometers and HPLCs, which are in great demand. However, they didn't know whether they needed to buy more because they didn't have insights into the utilization and scheduling. As a frame of reference, nowadays in many labs in pharma, um, instruments are still scheduled manually using whiteboards. It turned out that 60% of their instruments were underutilized compared to our uh, industry benchmark. Additionally, using uh, our utilization tool, they were also able to optimize uh, downtimes. Here is an example of our analytic, utilization analytic report. Uh, showing a utilization pattern of a mass spectrometer. Uh, each green bar represents the usage frequency of uh, an instrument of the mass spectrum uh, or the mass spec uh, during a specific hour of the day uh, during the week. Um, this data was extremely helpful for the, this customer because avoid the unnecessary caps, capex uh, purchases. The second um, the second slide, the second case that we're going to explore is uh, always monitoring. They wanted to monitor the environmental condition of the rooms in which the mass spectrometer and the HPLCs were located. And they used the Tetra Science monitoring solution to monitor humidity and temperature continuously for several months. Here I'm showing you the humidity and temperature in blue and red respectively uh, over uh, between June and July 2017. As you can see, the temperature is pretty constant. Here, of course, there is an impact of the sun during the day. However, the humidity undergoes large shifts and um, fluctuations during this period of time. The interesting thing that we discovered is that the humidity level was outside the range uh, for several, several times. The range here, I'm like reporting the manufacturer recommending the operating range. Um, so this data was very helpful for the customer to build a case internally to basically update their HVAC system. Uh, otherwise, it would have been pretty hard for them to like even talk about it. Uh, the next case study is uh, operational visibility. This same customer was interested in monitoring the, uh, their freezers and understand, uh, uh, be able to detect on time when freezers were about to break by monitoring the compressor electric power cycle. Um, compressors in freezer turn on and off regularly in order to keep the temperature constant. Uh, here on the top, I'm showing a compressor cycle for a freezer that, uh, for a healthy freezer. At the bottom, I'm showing a compressor cycle for a freezer that is about to break. As you can see, the compressor is constantly working, and that is bad because it means that something is, is about to happen. They used a Tetra Science monitoring solution to um, basically uh, recognize the failure before it happened, and they were able to send the unit uh, out for repair on time. 
uh, that basically prevented a consistent, a significant potential loss. Uh, the cool thing is that they're now using this data to do machine learning and to build a tool uh, to do preventive maintenance. So to summarize, here is the stack for IoT-driven digital transformation. At the very bottom, we have the operational efficiency with the, the tools that I just described to solve the pain points existing in the lab. Then informatics is basically responsible for collecting the data, do integrating reporting and compliance. And at the top, we have the intelligence level, which is basically responsible for uh, getting driving value out of the data. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Hey, Hi. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering how hard it is for a startup to work with a pharma company and get access to their data. Uh, how, many, how much time it took you guys and what are the challenges you guys faced? How much time do you have? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, at the beginning it's quite challenging, but uh, then it gets easier. Uh, the first time is always harder. <laughs> I would say uh, we work with uh, small to medium biotech companies and also large enterprises. Of course, the big enterprises are quite challenging, pri primarily for politics, I would say. So I was wondering if you have a, a proprietary hardware that you install on the instruments. How are you able to yes. monitor them and then do they hook up to the Wi-Fi? How does it? Work. We use a hardware, uh, hardware module. Uh, we built the module ourselves to connect basically the physical instrument to the cloud. And it's basically a Wi-Fi connected uh, module. And we, that can be programmed and managed from the cloud. So all we do is to basically go on site, install the, the, the module and leave it there. And, uh Follow-up question: Can a company buy one at a time, or how does it usually work? Getting a Tetra Science uh, service back. Generally, we now are at the stage where we work with uh, volumes that are larger than one. Uh, however, if you or if you or anyone is interested, we are always like happy to like uh, you know see what your actual needs are and uh, uh, current needs and future needs. Uh, so you mentioned machine learning. Are you guys doing that, or is that your customer doing that, or is that the okay both? Both. Yes. Okay. And do you work with bio equipment vendors to do that as well? Uh, with manufacturer, you mean? Yeah. Uh, we we do work with manufacturer. That's one of our uh, part of our business model, uh, because of course our customers are using instruments, and therefore we have an interest in connecting their instruments to the cloud. And so yes, we, uh, our goal is also to prevent the maintenance with like, our, our existing uh, partners. Uh, I'm Jason Kahana. Uh, I'm the founder uh, of, uh, of a small company. In fact, I'm also the only employee of uh, Integrity Biosolutions. And you know, an interesting piece of trivia is that Len and I were contemporaries at Merck. And uh, you know, it's it's been kind of important to me. You know, when I was invited to the GBSI, I didn't know what it was. And as I learned more about it, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because for 15 years of my career, I spent. Um, you know, leading projects mostly in, in target validation and early stage drug discovery in oncology. And, and I, would, I would suggest that at least five of those were spent, you know, trying to track down things that were irre irreproducible. Now, I'm 46 years old, which means that more than 10% of my life, uh, certainly, and, and substantially more of my professional life has been completely wasted. <laughs> and, and when one asks, you know, what, one, of the, one of the themes that's come up in the last few years about why things are as irreproducible as they are and if in fact they've gotten worse over the years has been, to a large extent, the rarification of, of federal funds for, for this. And, you know, when, when you, 
you know, what tends to happen is when you can't afford the stuff you need, you make do with the stuff you've got. And if it doesn't work, well, maybe you just publish it anyway. Um, and, and, you know, what Integrity Biosolutions, you know, our goal is, is in, in many ways to democratize, you know, science. And in, in this case, I'll talk about it, really bioprocess applications. You know, because it, it's my belief that, you know, the single or small uh, research group you know, trying to do stuff, it really can't, you know, they're being priced out of the market. And, and I think that there's a, a huge um, benefit to having, you know, good stuff that allows more people to do the science and, and, and would hopefully lead to more reproducibility. So Integrity was founded in 2015 um, to provide products and, and focused in the bioprocessing applications industry. Um, I'm gonna focus on the two dark blue, uh, the pipsqueak scientific instruments, and I'll, I'll talk about a couple of case studies, and then the Chojin cell lines. I won't talk about the other parts of the company. Um, and I will give you a little bit of background. We're headquartered in Sorrento Valley, which is a neighborhood in San Diego. It's where a lot of the very small um, biotech companies in San Diego reside. Uh, we, pr we, we provide both off the shelf, uh, although not so much of that, and custom products including a proprietary cho based cell line uh, for bioprocess, and I'll explain to you why that's, that's a value, um, as well as what I'll talk about more is some, some very fundamental scientific instrumentation, which, which again is at, at a price point and a, a level of, um, uh, it's at a level where it can be afforded and built into other instruments. Uh, we have a wet lab and an electronics lab. We encourage um, um, uh, customers and potential customers to come over, uh, visit either facility, and on and, and, and number of occasions we've had people sit down in front of the computer, redesign scientific instruments, and, and basically have them you know, virtually prototyped within literally minutes to hours to, to have these things changed. Um, the way the company actually started was a few years ago in my spare time, I, I developed a, a, a reagent that I, that I had become quite interested in for some immunology work I'd been asked to do. In this case, it was an anti-mouse uh, immunoglobulin D, anti-serum. Um, does this have a, a pointer? Um, I apologize for that. And what you can see here is that, you know, this anti-serum could very rapidly induce a B-cell response in mice and then could be used to, to, to see whether or not an anti-B-cell drug worked in vivo. And this could actually be done in the matter of a few hours. And was able to generate a, a very large amount of this material by myself with a little bit of CRO help. And then it actually, when, when I went to go have it tested, it actually, the entire project got bought out by a much larger company called MD Biosciences, which is a, a very nice immunology reagents and services company headquartered in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. So the B cell activator that's sold by MD, you know, helped fund the rest of, of Integrity, uh, Integrity Biosolutions. And you know what I'll talk about now is how that funded some of our custom uh, instrumentation for for the process development. So just to to start off with one that you know I think a lot of people can relate to is um, you know we use pH meters a lot. We've used them in the labs. Uh, they're generally a pain in the butt. Uh, that said, they're also very, very important for bioprocess applications because maintaining your, your bioprocess conditions, be they pH, dissolved oxygen, osmolarity, can actually have a very, very profound impact on the quality and the quantity, and, and the, the quality and the quantity of the product that you develop. Um, and because these products are such high margin products that can actually be very useful. I won't go into all the details about this, but what you can see, this is a custom solution uh, that runs off of a, you know, a, a fairly sophisticated microcontroller platform, but includes, you know, a screen, USB, UART, uh, an integrated Bluetooth, all at a, a price point I'll talk about later. And it's actually transmogrified. A lot of people, instead of wanting to build these into other instruments, wanted them for their labs. We made a cute little purple case for it. And actually, you know, we got a commission to make a, a, a much more interesting instrument, which actually normalizes pH in real time. Um, this actually led to another instrument, uh, an electrical conductivity meter, and again, built upon the same platform. Electrical conductivity meters tend to be very expensive and complex, particularly due to their need for things like alternating currents. We developed a new type of circuit which simulates alternating color current using uh, direct current. These are opposing uh, cur um, you know, voltage waves. And actually, we were able to build the entire pro product on, on basically a single um, 
I see, and you can imagine what that does for being able to customize it and what it does for price. Um, in addition, this is just a picture of it. It's communicating, I turned the screen off here, but it's communicating via this little Bluetooth mod module. This costs about $8, and it can basically send it, this to your process development uh, rig or to your phone or anything like that. It's really quite easy. The final product that I'll talk about is just a new motor controller. Uh, that's actually caught the attention of some of the larger motor companies, but for robotics, uh, you, um, you know, liquid, li um, you know uh, liquid dispensing. So the key advantages, and I'll go through this very quickly, is our price is way lower than most of the competitors. Our pH meter is $200 as opposed to about $900 for something from Fisher. We can do all the hardware and software in-house. Um, the last thing I'll go over very quickly is ChoGen, which is a Cho bioprocess, um, bioprocess line. A lot of people don't appreciate the fact that you can't use lines even from the ATCC for commercial work without relatively expensive licensing. We're providing a line that does not require that kind of licensing to the small, to the small business so that they can, you know, that, that again will increase the number of people that can do this kind of work. Um, this is just, you can, you can have access to these slides at your convenience, grows to high density, makes antibodies, achieves 115 mg per liter very easily. Uh, with that, I'll stop and take questions, and thank you very much. Sorry, I went a little bit over. <laughs> With the price point that you're talking about and the importance of the instruments that you're building for the scientific process, uh, why isn't the demand higher? I beg your pardon? Why isn't the demand higher? Uh, I mean, the demand's exceeded what I've been able to, to, to generate right now. What, we're really, what, what I'm really trying to do with some of these instruments is kind of OEM them out to other companies. So for instance, the motor controller had caught the attention of, of two of the major peristaltic pump companies, and now we're working with them to make a custom solution for their company with their name. We've actually OEM the P, pH meter and stuff like that. They're really not meant to be sold as standalone instruments, and my, my vision is to actually build them into, you know, other instruments. Um, you know, so you won't see our name on it, but it will keep the price of those instruments down. Okay, that clarifies. Thank you. Just curious how much automation you're using in your lab for cell culture. And None. I can't <laughs> afford any automation. <laughs> I build it myself, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Carlene Klum Thomas, working at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, the NIH. Oops. <laughs> okay. I just want to point out a recent article put into perspective, which put into perspective the risks of inaction to a problem many of us don't realize, many people don't realize exists or how they contribute to it. 300 million tons of plastic is produced every year, half of which is thrown away after a single use. And in our field of work, in industry, 99% of that or higher is discarded by design. Good science doesn't need to be at the expense of the environment. We are a huge part of this problem, especially in the high throughput screening realm. We're throwing away tons of microplates, DMSO solvent waste, and other things after a single use. The problem here is an, of a technical, technical one, it's of a mentality. These are some of the things that NCATS is doing to help minimize waste. And we encourage everyone to do the same in their labs. This is an example of a typical biochemical protocol that we would run on our high throughput screening systems where the plates go in one end, receive reagents, and right out the other into the trash. Here's that same protocol 
we've developed a method at NCATS to reuse these microplates using simply ethanol and water, allowing us to use the same plates repeatedly throughout a screen from hundreds of plates up to thousands using about 40 plates generally. This is the layout of our main high throughput screening system, one of seven systems we have at our facility. This is where we would run this uh, buffered screening process using the washing protocol. Once the plates are, have read after receiving substrate, the wash method occurs and then they go right back into circulation, allowing us to save time with setup. It allows us to only set up the process once instead of multiple times for multiple runs. It relieves storage space on our system, allowing us to run other things in parallel at the same time and increasing productivity. NCATS was awarded the HHS Green Champion Award in 2014 for this process, and since 2011, we've saved 40,000 plates and counting. This is an example of a, a project which uses washing protocol for the biochemical screening, an LDHA project. The screen was across 1,500 compound plates using only 40 assay plates. Each plate was used roughly 38 times throughout the process. The screen was run continuously across nine days, only requiring setup once. And out of this screen, a very weak hit came about, which was able to be optimized down to the nanomolar level. And if this watching protocol were to compromise the data, we would not have, this would have been buried in the noise. <laughs> Along those same lines, we wanted to apply the same tactic to washing cell-based assay plates. This work started as an SBIR with ion field systems, and eventually we came, came together, came up with a process using ion plasma technology to clean cell-based assay plates, which is much more difficult than biochemical. The cleaning method is when electrically generated atmospheric pressure plasma saturates room air with energy, oxidizing anything organic on contact. The method works pretty well, actually really well. If you look at the top plate that was used in a screen and in the fluorescent rectangle, you can see the controls. That's a bortezomib control, very toxic to cells. And below, you can see that same plate was washed and cells were put in, showing a nice clean signal compared with a new plate to the left. And as opposed to the biochemical screening process, this would save the plates for later use as opposed to a continuous screening. Using the same ion plasma technology, we were able to work with ion field systems to clean our slotted pins on our pin tool pin tools which were used in our screening, screening systems to add compounds in all of our assays, in most of our assays. We also use acoustic transfer. This method actually reduces carryover significantly and importantly saves DMSO waste. We have, this, we have these tip chargers on two of our systems, one of our primary main screening system used daily, as well as on an FDSS, which is typically very noisy calcium-based ion channel assay, which we use across 408 plates around th three weeks time, 34 plate batches, and no failed plates. Along the same line of saving reagents, we also have developed a real-time um, droplet detection system monitoring the droplets into our microplates during the screens, counting, in our case, 1,536 drops per plate. And this monitoring system allow allows us to get a fault message if there's a leak or a uh, block in one of these tips. So we can deal with it uh, at that time instead of finding out later and having to rescreen tons of plates and wasting cell culture reagents, et cetera. And this is a video which is showing droplet detection in, in the works. It's a, on a bioraptor using four tip dispense. And you'll see in a second, once it starts dispensing, dispensing the peaks will start appearing on the screen and that's how we're monitoring. These are some of the future things that we're trying to do at NCATS. And some of these are in the works now. I just want to point out the ion field systems 
the plasma knife was a product generated with the work for, with us in the SBIR, and a large pharmaceutical company has committed to buying one of these units, potentially up to five, for cleaning chemical or compound acoustic plates, which are very expensive and difficult to clean. And I just want to end with saying why is sustainability so important? Basically, it just, it needs to be. Oops. It needs to be. We shouldn't accept things how they are, but how they can be. These tactics are being incorporated at NCATS because the focus is on what's possible, not what is currently accepted. And with that, questions. Thank you. So I found this absolutely fascinating because in my mind, when you think about automation, robotics, you think more efficient, right? Uh, can do more, lower cost. But actually, typically, it's just higher throughput in the end, and we tend to do more. And if we don't think about this, as you're pointing out, um, we have massive explosion in waste, right? Chemical, plastic. You aside, your efforts aside, what can everybody else who's in the automation, who's building robotics, do to build this thinking into the design um, and encourage scientists to waste less? I think you just need to look at your processes and look at where things can be reused or cleaned, as I stated. I think high throughput screening in general uses a lot of reagents and plastic, and we can look at what can be actually cleaned, things like that. Or even when you develop your, li your screening libraries, we've gone from massive screening libraries down to smaller, more focused screening libraries. So instead of doing thousands of plates per screen, now we only have to do a few hundred. And the libraries are more focused, so the data should be more quality. Uh, so thank you, thank you for this eye-opening uh, uh, talk. Uh, two questions. First of all, uh, have uh, have you had uh, have you had the chance to sort of do the investment analysis? So I mean, like how much? So you're clearly saving money on the plates, but there yeah. is some cost involved in getting that clean. And second question: What is your thoughts on what's okay? You started with plates. What's the next tip? The thing is it tips? Is it? Uh... Yeah, actually, we are going to be integrating a tip washer onto one of our existing systems for pipette tip for library creation and other sample management uh, and other things. But we might be able to catch up after because I was cut off. So, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. First of all, I'd just like to thank uh, the organizers for putting on this amazing event today. Um, and also for a last minute change, you were supposed to hear from Professor Eric Clavens himself today, uh, but unfortunately he couldn't make it, so now you're stuck with me for the next uh, eight minutes, so I hope that's okay. Um, my name is, other clicker? Okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Mark Merrill, I'm a co-founder of Poncho Solutions, which is focused on uh, the commercialization of the aquarium laboratory operating system um, outside of the University of Washington through a software as a service business model. Um, I've been working with Eric Clavens on the last two and a half years or so um, on commercialization strategies for the software. Um, and as I'll talk about today, he's using it in the biofab at the University of Washington. Uh, the next several slides have already been given uh, today several times, and I'm sure they'll be given a lot more, so I'll kind of speed through them with a focus on how this is relevant to um, aquarium and biofab. Um, first of all, as I'm sure um, you know, a lot of us experience on a day-to-day -day basis, the laboratory uh, looks very similar to how it looked uh, a long time ago. Um, most importantly, from aquarium's perspective, um, the way the laboratory information is stored and transferred also looks very similar to the way it looked a long time ago. Um, uh, in fact, according to a, a recent publication, upwards of 90% of life science researchers still use uh, handwritten lab notebooks in their daily laboratory routine. Um, in addition to, to handwritten lab notebooks, we have electronic lab notebooks, we have Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, scientific know-how, uh, protocols from publications. The point is there's a huge lack of uniformity in the way that experimental workflow information is stored uh, and transferred and ultimately presented to um, the folks at the bench who are executing these workflows. 
The problem is, um, as we all know, um, reproducibility. Um, different people can run the same workflow, uh, both within the same lab and across many labs, and they can get wildly different results. I mean, I've personally been involved with projects where um, samples were mislabeled and the results were um, actually flipped from what they would have been. This was at a, a big company, by the way. Um, and rather than think about kind of human error that went into the results, uh, the scientists launched into a whole explanation for why their whole theory must have been different. And then they thought, well, wait a second, actually the, the samples were just mislabeled. So it's, it's, it's certainly a large problem. Again, this is nothing new. Um, I actually think the 28 billion, when you think about um, you know, research beyond preclinical research, um, other industries that use uh, biological technologies, for example, it's, uh, I would argue it's actually a bigger number than that. Um, so how does this fit into Aquarium and Biofab and Professor Clavens and Poncho? Um, well, uh, Eric is a computer scientist by training. Um, who came to synthetic biology in 2008. Uh, when he first came to the field, he thought, this is really cool, I can program biology, um, this looks really exciting. However, he found that he couldn't reproduce even very basic uh, synthetic biology experiments. Um, and those that he could reproduce, it took him an awfully long time. He gave a talk where you know, some of them actually took him years. Uh, so he thought, this is ridiculous, I'm a computer scientist, I can fix this. Before I can program biology, I have to program the lab. So what he did is he developed uh, this aquarium tool starting in 2013, which originally was focused um, primarily on the workflow itself. Um, he invented a language for uh, capturing workflow information in a uniform format and then presenting that information to uh, the person who's executing the workflow, again, in a very standardized fashion. Um, by virtue of uh, doing it this way, um, he's experienced um, now over the years that when different users uh, run his workflows, again, both within and outside of his actual laboratory, they tend to see the same results. Uh, many of the workflows, um, specific jobs, have reproducibility rates um, in excess of 90%, um, especially within his lab, which is a uh, dramatic improvement over um, sort of what we've seen um, earlier today. Um, so since 2013, Aquarium has evolved from uh, a workflow tool into um, a laboratory operating system. And we call it an operating system because it integrates many, many things in the lab, um, starting with the workflow through to technicians and instruments and robots and samples and inventory items. Um, and it brings all this stuff together kind of through this common, um, this common software language. Um, it includes modules you know, around the workflow as well as around inventory, around lab performance tracking, cost tracking, um, it does lots and lots of things. So where has he taken this? Um, uh, he's used this um, laboratory operating system as the uh, core operational technology behind the University of Washington Biofab, um, which he launched uh, last year in 2016. Now, what does the Biofab do? It offers um, automated experimentation um, through the cloud. Uh, and there's a next slide that shows kind of how that works. But currently today, you can see some of the workflows that he offers. Uh, and he has lots more in development, um, some which are not public yet, but I know he's looking forward to announcing. Um, so how does this work um, at the Biofab? A customer interacts with Aquarium to um, use various drag and drop interfaces to design uh, experimental workflows, which are then submitted into Biofab, and then the user gets their data back. Um, and Biofab basically operates as a black box to them in that the experimentation is performed. Um, however, using Aquarium, they can do various things like track the status of their work and um, kind of see where it is, um, and get a sense of timing on when to expect data. Um, and Aquarium is leveraged within um, the Biofab to kind of guide technicians, to integrate machines. Uh, one comment about this is Aquarium and Biofab is um, focused on a high level on capturing entire workflows, uh, meaning it's not a core focus today um, for this effort to automate every single instrument um, and robot involved with the workflow, um, but it's very much a human in the loop system, which is why automation was in, in quotes on the title. So, you know, we forego kind of some of that lower level detail to capture entire workflows, um, just, you know, serving, you know, again, as that human as the interface between the, the system, the software, and the, the instrument. Um, a few uh, photos of sort of the, you know, aquarium in action within, within the biofab. What does this actually look like? Um, you can see, you know, various um, touchscreen monitors positioned around the lab at benches. 
um, and uh, the way people interact with it, a monitor next to an instrument to kind of give you a sense for the varying degrees of um, interaction with instruments. There are some instruments that have drivers built in where the, the language itself actually talks to the instrument, especially within his lab, but you know, that's again a small focus on this. So then lastly, you know, a few numbers. Um, uh, aquarium over the years, it, it, it now does a lot of work in terms of heavy lifting, hundreds of jobs per week, tens of thousands of dollars a month in research supported at Biofab. Uh, and again, I'll point to the reproducibility number around jobs um, performed within the system in excess of 90%. Um, so with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to uh, any questions. Um, I'm curious, how would the Biofab workflow manifest in a published paper? Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the workflow is a black box to the clients. So let's say a paper were to come out of the project. Uh, how, would, how, would, how would that you know, uh, be uh, explicated in the method section or what have you? Um, you know, it's a great question. I think it's better suited for um, Eric himself operating Biofab and then um, the users of Biofab uh, in terms of how they're thinking about integrating that into their work. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I would imagine it wouldn't be too dissimilar from um, you know, other points of outsourcing. I mean, everybody outsources uh, sequencing and synthesis these days, and you know, that's been happening for a long time. So. Um, Biofab is just an extension and that now you can outsource um, just, you know, more of your workflows. Um, but again, I think that's a specific question for those, those people doing it. You mentioned on one of the slides limb systems. I was just wondering if that's something you're rolling out yourself or you're integrating with your users existing limb systems if they are available. Um, yeah, that's a that's a an excellent question. Within Biofab, the limbs is integrated directly within the Aquarium Laboratory operating system. It's a very dynamic system whereby uh, the the limbs um, connects directly with the workflows. So not only does it show you what's in your inventory, but when you click an item, um, it shows you a history of that item in terms of how it was used historically across all of your experimental workflows. Now, obviously, that only works when you use the limbs directly associated with Aquarium which happens in Eric's lab because he invented it, um, as well as, uh, you know, we've had conversations with other folks, especially in industry, through Poncho about this. Uh, but there is, we're working on um, various integration points with existing limb systems. Um, just a quick note on behalf of Poncho, uh, we just started this company a couple of months ago, um, again, focused on commercializing Aquarium um, outside of lab as a software as a service, and this is a key question for us, for people with existing limbs is, and what's, what's the best way for us to do this? And integration is certainly possible. Um, hi, I have a question. How many different types of protocols and procedures do you actually handle in this? Um, is this uh, a few, you know, is this everything that I could think of doing? You know, where, where are you on that spectrum? Uh, certainly, so the current inventory within Biofab is um, several hundred different workflows um, covering uh, you know, basic things like cloning, media prep, through to there's a batch around yeast, uh, there's something around uh, tissue, um, mammalian cells, um, agrobacterium, uh, it's quite large. Um, now, uh, you know, Poncho doesn't have access to, to all of that outside of the lab, um, but uh, what we do have is a very cool tool for, um, again, using a drag and drop interface and various planners that don't require writing code to develop um, additional workflows kind of using what's in the system. And I, I'm getting a signal here that I'm out of time, so more questions. Yeah. You mentioned that the amount of research that you're handling is 90% reproducible, is that right? Yeah, there's a the caveat here is that when you talk about reproducibility, I mean, Obviously, you have to be careful with how you define lots of different things. There are experiments, there are jobs. An experiment consists of you know, lots of protocols linked together. A protocol consists of lots of little jobs linked together. Um, so to, uh, and again, none of these are really controlled experiments, whereby we're actually taking the same thing and running it within an aquarium and outside of aquarium. Um, but what we do know is over the last four years of data within aquarium, that individual jobs 
and individual protocols, we can go back and look at, okay, this protocol has been run 500 times. We can actually look at that historical data and say 90% of those runs were successful. So that's what I mean by many of the, um, in fact, the majority of the jobs and the protocols within Aquarium have uh, reproducibility rates well in excess of 80%, and many of them are in excess of 90%. Is that something you're tracking over time so that you can actually uh, rate a process according to its reproducibility? Absolutely. Number? There's a uh, version control built into this platform as well, so you can go back and look at, okay, here's a specific protocol. Here are 10 prior versions of it. What did we change across these versions? Why are some of them working? Why are some of them crashing? Um, and, you know, there's a whole analytics component of this as well that allows you to kind of mine some of this stuff. Um, and it's simple things, like some of it has to do with the way that you wash glassware. Um, some of it has to do with um, which is, could be interesting, different brands of reagents um, mm -hmm. have been linked within the system with different reproducibility rates. So um, it, it's just there's a whole mountain of data here that's, uh, you know, that is mineable by uh, Biofab to kind of answer some of these questions. Okay, thanks.